Number 31, The God of the Bible. Chapter 8, Why the Sabbath? September 9, 2023. John Pauline. Well, today our topic is Why the Sabbath? And this is the eighth part in a series, The God of the Bible, led by John Pauline. But before we start, Livius is going to offer prayer for us. Thank you, Lord, for your steadfast love, your sacrifice, and for creating a space for us to investigate and look into your wonderful character. Be with Dr. Pauline on this, your Sabbath day, as he leads our discussion on why the Sabbath. Also, be with each one here, those listening. I invite the Holy Spirit to bring to our minds new ideas, new insight, to reorient our understanding of who you are, your character, so that we might trust you more fully and completely. In the precious name of Jesus, I ask this. Amen. So we are continuing a series, The God of the Bible, which is exploring more deeply some of the biblical and textual basis for ideas in the book Conversations About God. And the 10th session in the original Conversations About God was on the Sabbath. And so this will be the eighth session in the current series. I direct you to the very first item in your handout. And I'd just like to read that slowly with you because that sort of summarizes where we have been so far. In the previous sessions, we learned that peace in the universe was originally based on mutual trust between God and his creatures and among the creatures themselves. We also learned that lack of trust in God and his government is the root cause of sin and rebellion in the universe. Conversely, trust in God is the key to solving the universal crisis. So there we've kind of summarized the first three sessions that we had in this series. If trust is truly the solution to sin and rebellion, the next crucial question concerns the method by which God rebuilds trust. In session four, we learned that God does not build trust through power and force, through miracles, or through assertions and claims. Instead, he builds trust through the scriptures, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, life experience, and the testimonies of others. If the real issue in the universe were over power, God could have settled it a long time ago. So in session five, we noticed that Satan has not accused God of being weak. He's accused God of abusing his superior power and of manipulating the evidence. Jesus demonstrated his right to rule through the way that he behaved while on earth and in the way that he died. Session 6. In addition to the cross, there's plenty of evidence in the Bible that no one needs to be afraid of God. In this session, Session 8, we explore the question of God's purpose in establishing the Seventh-day Sabbath. So that's a summary of where we have been, and we will get into the Sabbath at this point. Let's look at number two, where it says, while the validity of the Sabbath is firmly established in the Old Testament, many Christians question whether or not it was God's intention that the Sabbath be observed by Christians. Crucial to answering that question is whether the Sabbath goes back to Sinai or all the way back to creation. So just to sort of reflect on that for a moment, if the Sabbath's origin is at Sinai, then it should be reasonable to suggest that the Sabbath was something God did specifically for the Jews and not necessarily the rest of the human race. But if the Sabbath went back to creation, if Adam was expected to keep it, then that puts the Sabbath on a totally different plane. It's there for the entire human race. And its use among Israel was simply a model for how God wanted the rest of the human race to respond. So there's the crucial question. For Christians, often the Sabbath is discarded. They say, well, that was from Sinai. That was for the Jews. That was the Old Covenant. But now we're in the New Covenant, and you know we're reaching out to the Gentiles and so on. So the Sabbath is sort of irrelevant. So in our first section here, we're going to explore what's the evidence, the actual biblical evidence, 
And I want to just mention, sometimes I present things as less certain than I myself may have them to be for the simple reason I deal with people from other religions all the time, and many of those religions do not have a Christian background or even a Jewish background. And so when one makes an assertion, one needs to be prepared to respond in a way that makes sense to other people. So sometimes we may draw conclusions based on things that make sense to us, but would not make sense to others. So I sometimes probe, you know, why are we thinking the way we are thinking? Not to undo that, but to simply say, as other people wrestle with the ideas that we find so precious, how can we bring them to understand and appreciate what we appreciate? And so let's, Adventists, in this question, point to Genesis 2 and Exodus 20 as proof that the Sabbath goes back to creation and is therefore valid for Christians today. But what do these texts actually say? So let's start with Genesis 2 and verses 1 through 3, kind of a core text when it comes to the Sabbath. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. All right. So in verse one, it tells us that creation is complete. When you come to chapter two, God has finished the creation that was being described in chapter 1. And it tells us then, by on the seventh day, God finished the work he had been doing and rested from all of his work. And God blessed the seventh day, made it holy, because he rested from the work of creating that he had done. So traditionally, Adventists indicate, well, in Genesis 2, the Sabbath was established at creation. What do you think what kind of response would you get from somebody who doesn't believe that? Based on this text, what's missing in the text? Larry? Well, I'm not sure if this is going to answer that question, but I reread Heschel's book, The Sabbath, and it's amazing, the ideas that you get. I noticed something in the reading of that text that I'd never noticed before because of the way Heschel describes the creation of Sabbath. God still worked on the Sabbath. He created something because it says, and he finished his work on the Sabbath. They didn't say he finished it Friday night. He said he finished it on the Sabbath. So if that's true, and then if Heschel's correct, therefore I think there's a logical link that the entire process of creation included the Sabbath, that the Sabbath wasn't just something that was tacked on as an afterthought. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that the suggestion is then creating the Sabbath and resting are not at odds with each other in God's mind. Are you asking me? Well, I'm just exploring what you said. And I would have to look up the Hebrew to you know, establish more carefully. But in my NIV, it says, by the seventh day, God had finished his work. That's a little bit of a different nuance than I was expecting. Would you read the beginning of verse 2 again, Terry, in your translation? And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done. Okay, on the seventh day, by the seventh day. So that translation would seem to provide the nuance that the creation was finished on the seventh day, not before the seventh day. I would have to look at the original and see. Probably it's a bit ambiguous. Anyone have a different translation? Yeah, I have the American translation. Mm -hmm. And it says, on the seventh day, God brought his work to an end on which he had been engaged, desisting on the seventh day from all his work in which he had been engaged. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it would seem to me, based on my previous work on the Hebrew of this passage, that it probably is a little bit ambiguous and was debated by the rabbis whenever they would run into these kinds of things. So let's leave that one aside for now. And if we get further, we can get back to you on that. But the key thing here is, who is it that rests on the Sabbath, according to Genesis 2? The creator of everything. Okay. 
it says in my translation that God finished the work he had been doing. And so on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Now you can see the ambiguity in there. God finished the work, but he rested from all his work. And so I think I've always read that as he finished the work after six days and the seventh day, he was not working in that same sense, but was resting from his work. And God blessed the Sabbath day, made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work. Who's not resting? No mention of Adam. You see, the text doesn't explicitly say the Sabbath was made for Adam. It says God created the Sabbath and God rested on the Sabbath and God enjoyed the work of his hands. So for those who do not wish to see the Sabbath as going back to creation, as far as we're concerned, there's a loophole in there that I wanted to mention. All right, Julie. I think when you ask the first question of what other people might say if they didn't, how they might counter that, they would also probably say there's no command. But I think this is maybe stretching it, but I think in these this passage itself, there is a subtle invitation or expectation that we might miss. And that is because you've got this eternal being, and it depends on, I don't know how the Hebrew reads, but when we use the word rest, it can mean several things. One is that we just stop doing something, and I think that's kind of where the Hebrew is going, but it also implies time and space. And God is moving into our time and space. He's on this earth. He's created all this stuff. He has all these living beings. And he's confining himself for a day into that time and space. That would seem like an invitation to that entire creation to be with him. I like that very much. That's a very sharp comment, I think. I think what Heschel would probably say, coming back to what the person Larry mentioned, the rabbi, I think he would observe Adam was created in the image of God. And that suggests that what God does, Adam would do too. And a Jewish son is expected to behave like his father. So I think in the Jewish mind, the absence of mention of Adam is not troubling because it's implied, it's understood in the very thing. And I think those are solid arguments and that we can rest on them, but they probably still won't be convincing to the average Christian, the average Sunday keeper who wishes to see things a little bit differently. So we'll keep that in the air and come back as we move forward and look at other texts. Neil? The translation that I'm looking at says, by the seventh day, God finished the work that he had been doing, and he ceased on the seventh day all the work that he had been doing. Mm -hmm. So did he do it at the beginning of the seventh day, in the middle of the seventh day, or at the end of the seventh day? That, I think, is left a bit ambiguous there. So, yeah, I suspect the, the Hebrew is ambiguous enough there for both of those translations. The question of, you know, did Adam keep it? The text fails to nail that down, but I think it's at least implied in the Hebrew context. All right, Larry? You can make up reasons to not believe anything you want to do. That's the cool thing about being human. When I look at Alter, Robert Alter's idea of how he puts it, he says, and he ceased on the seventh day from all of the tasks. Again, it's ambiguous, but for the purpose of, I'm going to try and present this idea as if I was going to present it, because I've just now, as we're having these discussions, thought of this. If I was trying to convince you who are a non-Advent, a Seventh-day believer of that, my argument would be that since God created, and he's all through the week, there are things that are happening. Why do we suppose that just because man was created that God was done? There's nothing in there that says that God had no further plans for anything else. So until you get to the seventh day, and now it says he's completed everything. So somehow the seventh day has to be linked to the entire creative process and to things that were in God's mind to accomplish during the plan of, and the idea of creation. And so that's probably how I'd try and begin my discussion with you the going down that road. So don't know if that's helpful or not. Yeah. Well, Daniel notes one other issue here, that the word Sabbath isn't here. It is there in a way because it's a verb. God Shabbated on the seventh day. On the seventh day, he 
Shabbated, etc. So if you read the Hebrew, you understand what is in view there, but the noun Sabbath is not used here as well, nor does it state that the Sabbath was expected from Adam and not just from God. All right, Liz? I'm wondering what it means for God to bless something. It certainly isn't like he needed to have a nap because creating was too much work. And that whole concept of God blessing a certain and creating this certain space and time leads me (laughs) into thinking that there was a bigger picture involved. And so it would seem that that is a introduction into the great controversy model and the fact that this was a space and time for the whole onlooking universe because obviously Adam and Eve did not know about the great controversy probably at this moment in time. So to me, this would have involved the universe spending time in saying, now how did this week answer Satan's charges? So I think we maybe looking at that word blessed and what it means might be beneficial. I like your point because blessing is something that comes as a consequence. You know, the blessings of the covenant are the good things that happen when you keep it. To bless the Sabbath day, it seems to me, implies that the Sabbath would be a bringer of good. It would be a bringer of positive outcomes. So blessing the Sabbath implies that it was for human beings in that God designed it to be a blessing, to be a positive for human beings. Implication there. And remember, Jesus read the Hebrew Old Testament very carefully and understood it very carefully. So when we do get to Jesus and he clarifies these points, I don't think he's adding something that's not there. He's simply elaborating on what he as a Jew would understand is there. So helpful point, Liz. Livius? I kind of wanted to continue Larry's thought of what came before. And sometimes it's helpful to think about what came before some specific event and what came before our days one through six. And it says that in the image of God, he created them, male and female. And so I'm wondering... Are they just the ones that were created in the image of God, or is everything that God created designed to work with his image? I wish I could bring in some New Testament in here, but what came before and him stepping back or ceasing, I think for me is when we said that Adam didn't stop, didn't stop working, maybe it shows something that he steps aside for investigation, a time of inquiry, a time of looking into his nature and what the things that he has made. Yeah, I'm enjoying the way we're wrestling here. And I would just make an observation that one of the things I learned when I translated, if you don't mind the term, conversations about God into written language, etc., is how well Graham Maxwell knew the New Testament, the Bible as a whole, but particularly the New Testament, and little nuances in the Greek and stuff. So what we are doing is really going back behind and looking at the foundation and wrestling with the challenges that you find there. And that was the whole purpose of this series, is to go below the surface of conversations about God and explore some of the biblical foundations. And if you understand those well, then the concepts become easier to share with others. And as a fellow New Testament scholar, I'm certain that Graham had many points where he was kind of like, well, I don't know which way to go with this one, and wrestling with it, and then coming to see it in a larger picture that would bring things together. So that we're going to try to redo some of that work together. And at times it's a struggle, but you wouldn't expect if you understood God, that it would be simple. If we could understand God, he wouldn't be God. So he's far beyond what we can grasp, but it's healthy for us to strive and to wrestle. All right, Lou? The Sabbath is about relationship, relationship to God, relationship to family, and from there on around the world. All right, Bill? I have a tonic, which is a Jewish Bible. This was the new Jewish Publication Society translation according to the traditional Jewish scriptures. 
And if I might read that and start at 131 through 23, it says, And God saw all that he had made and formed, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. The heaven and the earth were finished in all their array. On the seventh day, God finished the work that he had been doing. And he ceased on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, because on it God ceased from all the work of creation that he had done. And that's the way the Jewish translation reads. Very helpful. The first phrase of verse 2 again. Uh, on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had been doing, and he ceased, or rested, on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So it goes with on, a number of the translations have said on, and others have said by, and so forth. Yeah, that's helpful. Appreciate that. All right, so Genesis 2 leaves us with the origin of the Sabbath as a concept, but a brick or two short of being able to demonstrate that it went all the way back to the beginning for the human race as a whole, which is the point that is at issue. So let's go to Exodus 20 and verses 8 to 11. That's a second text, I think, that most Sabbath keepers would go to to say that it goes all the way back to creation. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Does that have any implications for how to read Genesis 2? It says six days you labor, seventh day is the Sabbath, because... In six days, God created, and the seventh day, he rested. So I think that might lean us, as I said, I suspect the Hebrew of Genesis 2-2 is ambiguous on that point. Hebrew has only three prepositions, and they have to carry a ton of weight and often leave considerable ambiguity behind. But it seems that the wording of the fourth commandment is clearer, that the work was done in the six days, and that the Sabbath then represents a period of rest. Does the fourth commandment say that Adam kept it? Still does not. Okay, so our two favorite texts probably fall a little bit short of making the point that is so important for our non-Sabbath keeping friends. All right, Dan. I wonder whether we might consider the seventh day, the Sabbath day, rest and the idea of rest, as some people have suggested, the completion of creation. That is, from a psychological standpoint, if you look at it, the total person, rest is a very important component of it. If you sort of think about us sleeping for several hours every night, that whole concept of rest, I think, to me, is an important concept in completing the whole person. And so I think the fact that God, throughout the Bible, in the Old Testament, he has Moses continually telling them to remember, remember, remember. But rest, I think, is a very important component of who we are. And I think the fact that there's such an emphasis made on that, I think if we kept it, we might not have quite the amount of psychological and maybe physical problems that we currently have. Mm -hmm. Yes, it seems to be embedded as part of the cycle. Of course, God as the creator understands what we need and would create accordingly. If the concept of rest, and keep in mind, okay, was the Sabbath the seventh day for Adam? No, it was not. It was the second day. All right. So to say the Sabbath is the seventh day, Adam, you know, would have been keeping the wrong day. It wasn't the seventh day yet, etc. So why does the Sabbath come when it comes? It's because God has completed his creation. And I would presume he and Adam together were reflecting on that creation and learning from it. And so resting includes reflecting on what God has done, reflecting on God's character, etc., which is what we are doing in this session. So rest is not totally incompatible with study, 
with prayer, with reflecting on what God has done. That can be hard work in its own sense. But the resting here perhaps has a little more nuance than simply taking a nap or recovering from hard labor. Of course, in ancient times, the six days was really hard labor. It was toil. And Sabbath was a day off from hard labor. Sabbath as a day off from sitting at the computer it may not seem quite such a blessing, but when you're doing heavy lifting six days a week, the Sabbath, that Sabbath rest, every fiber of your being is being blessed by it. When you look at verse 11 again, for in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So he almost seems to be here alluding to Genesis 2. So it indicates a couple of things. First of all, the basis for the week is in the Sabbath. And scholars have looked for a natural basis for the Sabbath. The month is based on the moon going around the earth. The year is based on the earth going around the sun. But there's no astronomical cycle that's a week long. And scholars have wrestled with that. The best anyone's come up with probably is that the lunar cycle is 28 days and scratch, you know, 28.8 or something like that. And so the idea is maybe eventually breaking it up into four units made sense to people. And so that's how the Sabbath and the week got started. So the origin of the week, uh, the Bible's the only credible explanation, I think, that the week was simply something that God ordained, God placed into the creation. So the basis for the week is the creation, and the basis for the Sabbath is that God rested on the Sabbath day. But still, Exodus 20 doesn't say that Adam was intended to keep it. So we go on to the next question. What do Exodus 31, 13 and Ezekiel 20, 12 tell us about the significance of the Sabbath for Israel? So Exodus 31, 13. You yourself are to speak to the Israelites. You shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, given in order that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. All right, so here it indicates an additional element, which I think becomes significant when you get to the book of Revelation, and that is that the Sabbath is a seal, a sign between God and his people. There's something a little different about the Sabbath from the others. It doesn't say, you know, put God first, have no other gods before me. It doesn't say on what day you do that or give any further instruction. It's just a core principle. Thou shalt not kill, you know, kind of makes sense if you don't want to get killed. But on the Sabbath day, a specific day makes it a little bit different. It's an obedience you can't do every day. So it's a little bit different from the others. And so it became a sign commandment that those who keep the Sabbath would be telling the world, we are Yahweh's children. We are those who are marked by your mark. Something similar is said in Ezekiel 20, 12. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between me and them, so that they might know that I, the Lord, sanctify them. So the Sabbath is a public acknowledgement of one's relationship with God. And as such, it's more than just generic. God says this public sign will be done by worshiping, you know, sundown to sundown on the seventh day of the week. Worshiping on another day won't fulfill that detail, that this is something, a sign, you know, between us. A Christmas tradition is to get a pair of turtle doves and you give one to your friend and one you keep, whether it's live bird or whether it's just a, a knickknack or something like that. And that becomes a symbol of friendship. You each have one of those. It becomes a symbol of friendship. And worshiping on the seventh day is a token of the bond between human beings and God. So the Sabbath is a sign commandment. It's not just a generic command, this is good for your life and so on. It does mean something in terms of our relationship with God. 
keep in mind that for our purposes, that underlines the importance of the insight that Adam was intended to keep it. If you don't have that clear, then Exodus 31 is part of Sinai. It's all clear. You know, this is for the Jews. This is part of Sinai and stuff. It has nothing to do with me. I'm a Christian. You know, so that's the challenge. When we're starting out, we having a session here on the Sabbath and establishing what the Sabbath is, is our first purpose as we go through here. But if we haven't established that Adam was intended to keep it, then there's always the loophole that a Christian will say, well, Exodus 31 doesn't apply to me. That's for the Jews. The Sabbath was part of their covenant with God. It's the old covenant, and we're into the new covenant. Lou? So when did it become legalistic, pharisaical issue with the Jews? Certainly in Jesus's time, but it must have been before that too. Well, some would suggest the origin of legalism is Exodus 24, 8 where after God was done thundering on Sinai and so on, Israel with one voice said, all that the Lord has said, we will do. And that, in a sense, is the expression of the old covenant, the expression of salvation by obedience. And of course, it's only a, a few chapters to the golden calf. And it becomes very clear that attempting to use obedience as the ground of your connection with God is probably not super helpful. So, yeah, when was the Sabbath treated legalistic? Probably fairly early on. Human beings are inclined to be legalistic. Some of it comes from guilt. Others of it comes simply from people want to know, give me what I need to do and I'll sign the dotted line and we're all good. For many people, the idea that salvation is a free gift is troubling because they've probably been trying to earn it for 30 years or 70 and it's hard to believe that you've worked that hard and that it didn't matter. It's very hard to give up. So legalism and Sabbath keeping have always, I think, from the beginning, been companions. So the question is, and it's one reason for this whole session, the question is, can we establish a different perspective on the Sabbath that will enable us to avoid some of that legalism? in the future. So it's good to bring that up and we'll keep that in the back of our minds. But now you're all hanging here. Let's go to the New Testament and see if the New Testament may clarify the very issues that we're concerned with here. So how does the New Testament affirm the validity of Sabbath for the followers of Jesus? We'll start with Mark 2.27. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. All right, very simple statement. The Sabbath was made. The Greek word there, agenito, is the very word used frequently for creation in Genesis 1 and elsewhere in the New Testament. So the Sabbath was made. It was created for man. And we stop here for a minute because the Greek is actually the man. The Sabbath was made for the man. Now, here it's perhaps significant that the name Adam is not a name. It's actually a title. In the beginning, if you're reading through Genesis, it's the man, Ha-Adam. So the man, Ha-Adam, was made in the image of God and so on. It was only in chapter 5 of Genesis that Adam becomes a name. So when Jesus says the Sabbath was made for the man, I think that reflects him saying, that the Sabbath was made for Adam, Ha-Adam, the man, not the man for the Sabbath. Adam wasn't created for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for Adam. So I think Mark 2.27 is the clearest statement. And right out of the mouth of Jesus himself, that the Sabbath goes all the way back to creation, that the Sabbath is for the entire human race. Even if you read the man in the Greek, in abstract, which is possible, it's still Sabbath was made for humanity. It doesn't say Jewish humanity, Israelite humanity. The Sabbath was made for humanity, and that means it goes back to creation. That means it applies to every human being. So Mark 2.27, I think, is the key text. The Sabbath was made, created 
for Adam, and therefore Adam was expected to observe it. And that brings together everything that we've noticed in Genesis 2 that if human beings are made in the image of God, then what God does is the model for them. If God rested on the Sabbath day, that was for the image of God to do as well. If God blessed the Sabbath day, then it's intended to be a plus for human beings if they keep it. So in my mind, Mark 2.27 is a crucial text that has often been overlooked by Seventh-day Adventists for this purpose showing that the Sabbath goes all the way back to creation. There's one other text I think that is helpful here, and that's Luke 23, 54 to 56. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath day, they rested according to the commandment. All right, so the day of the cross is the day in view. The day of the cross is the preparation day. Now, evangelists will say, when was Jesus crucified? And people respond, Good Friday. So that kind of settles it for most people. But in the Jewish mind, there was no Good Friday. Jesus had not yet been memorialized in that way. So it simply says the preparation day. And then after the preparation day, they worshiped on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Now, what's the significance of that? Luke is writing the earliest, 62 AD. And I say the earliest because that's roughly the time, you know, Paul's trial in Rome is presumed to have concluded. I think Paul was probably executed 64, 65. The trial that Acts mentions may have been an earlier one. There is some recollection that Paul was freed by Nero and went about some further missionary tours and then was called back to Rome and executed a couple of years later. So 62 is the earliest that Luke could have been written. And he doesn't write the Sabbath day as taught by the Jews. The Sabbath day I mean, he could easily have said, these women, they were Jews, they kept the Sabbath like Jews do. But he makes the point, they kept the Sabbath according to the commandment. And I think this strongly implies that the Sabbath was taken for granted by the church in the 60s when Luke is writing. It was fairly early in the second century that some began to go in other directions, but Luke 23, I think, is strong confirmation that the Sabbath was solid, understood for Christians in the first century. Any question or comment on that? If not, we'll move ahead to number four. It says, read James 2.12, Galatians 3.25, John 10.10, and Mark 2.27. Yes, we just read Mark 2.27, but we didn't mention something that's significant for this question. What was God's ultimate purpose in providing humanity with the Sabbath. We've established, I think, that the Sabbath is not limited to the Jews, not limited to Mount Sinai, but is for the whole human race, goes back to creation. If that's the case, then what was God's purpose in giving the Sabbath to the whole human race? And I think these texts here give us some clues. So let's start with James 2.12. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. All right. So what is the purpose of the law in general? To provide for human freedom, to provide for liberty. God's laws are designed to bring freedom rather than a sense of oppression. So for starters, this rules out the idea that the Sabbath is a burden that God has placed on people and do it or else. James says that God's laws are laws of freedom, laws that bring freedom. Now, Galatians 3.25. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. All right, now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. What Galatians 3 brings out, maybe we should have read more context, it brings out that the purpose of the law was to bring us to Christ. 
was to be like a tutor taking us to school to make sure we get what we need. So the purpose of God's laws is positive. It's to lead us to Christ. It's to bring us freedom. Let's go to John 10.10. 10. And like the first two texts, it doesn't speak specifically about Sabbath, but we're getting to that. But John 10.10 10 again gives us a bigger picture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. All right, by thief in this parable, Jesus was referring to Satan that satan's mission is to kill and to steal and to destroy but jesus says i have come that they might have life and have it abundantly so god's purpose in his laws are abundant life god's purpose in the sabbath one of his laws would be abundant life god does not give these things to be a burden a stress a further obstacle in our lives so the purpose of the sabbath is going to be along the lines of freedom and blessing etc michael when barbara and i were first married our first anniversary i forgot it <laughs> a good friend of mine tell me that's worth seven years of guilt <laughs> <laughs> yeah what i question i have though is the majority of christian churches use sunday as their sabbath are we going to get to the question of how that came about? Well, that probably wasn't part of my thinking, so I'm happy that you asked. And since we were on the topic of why Sabbath for Christians, how did Sunday uh, come about? And Samuel Bakayoki is a fascinating fellow, a, a friend of mine, who did his doctorate at the Vatican, the Gregoriana Institute in the Vatican. And he did it on the change of Sabbath to Sunday. And the fascinating thing, he says his teachers gathered at the defense and said that they had changed their minds about the Sabbath. I think the position of the Vatican before then had been that Jesus changed the Sabbath. Right from the beginning, the church kept it right from the beginning. I think Bakayoki demonstrated some of what we're discussing here, that the New Testament doesn't indicate that you know Jesus changed the day. But rather, Bakayoki showed that it happened beginning in the second century. And historically, it seems to be anti-Judaism that's at the core. When religions break apart and Christians and Jews broke apart between 70 AD, destruction of Jerusalem, when the Christian abandonment of Jerusalem was found to be hurtful by the Jews, and they said they're not trustworthy anymore. So from that time on, a separation with the synagogue began. And when religions separate, they both tend to lose something. Because in separating, they've got to distinguish themselves from each other. And so James Dunn, a famous British scholar, evangelical scholar of the first century Christianity, said it was almost like Jews and Christians got around a table to finalize the divorce. And the Jews said to the Christians, you know, we love the Messiah, but every time we talk about Messiah, people think we're Christians and we can't have that. So you keep the Messiah. And the Christians said to the Jews, yeah, well, we love the Sabbath, but every time we keep the Sabbath, people think we're Jews. So you keep the Sabbath. And the Jews said to the Christians, we love eschatology. You know, we love the prophets and stuff. But every time we start thinking about the future, the Romans come and slap us upside the head again. So you keep the eschatology. And in 35 volumes of the Babylonian Talmud, there's one page of eschatology. Even though much of the Bible, much of the Old Testament is full of it, it was largely abandoned in contrast, you see. And the Christians to the Jews said, we love the Old Testament, but when we speak from the Old Testament, people think we're Jews. So you can see how in separating from Judaism, Christianity tend to have a negative view toward the Sabbath and a negative view toward the Old Testament. And so Marcion around 150 basically says the Old Testament was a different God, an evil God, and true Christians will not pay much attention to it. Similarly, around the same time, increasing hostility toward the Sabbath came in because it was identified 
with Jews. And so the anti-Semitism, I think, came in with all of that. There is evidence that Sabbath continued to be kept in at least some parts of the empire up to the 5th century, but fairly early the Sabbath you know, began to be abandoned, particularly in Rome. It started in Rome, I think, with Justin Martyr. We have evidence that the church at Rome was already worshiping on the first day of the week by 155 or so in the second century. So that's a little nutshell summary, but thank you for asking that question because I'm sure other listeners will have had it as well. Typical an ability to screw things up. Well, human beings have an infinite capacity. And, and remember what I've said on other occasions, God is at work in every religion and Satan is at work in every religion. I think it was God's intention. Jesus didn't come to start a new religion. He came to reform the Jewish faith. He came to reform Israel and, and bring it back to its mission. It is only when he was rejected by the leadership, not by the people, many of the people were in a different place, but the leadership for its own political purposes made the executive decision, he's got to go so we can survive. And that was a fatal move in terms of the cooperation between Jews and Christians. And in losing Judaism, Christians lost a lot. And Christian orthodoxy became different than it was before. You can read an atheist, uh, Bart Ehrman, who gives a history of the early centuries, and he'll tell you the exact same thing, that tragically Christians, when they split with Judaism, lost their understanding of the Sabbath, the Old Testament, etc. And that has affected Christianity ever since. And that's why Adventists have understood themselves to be repairers of the breach restorers, you know, like the sanctuary idea, the sanctuary will be restored at the end of time, that Christianity has drifted to some degree from God's original purpose for it, and feeble and defective as Adventists may be, we have in our minds this idea that uh, restoring God's mission, restoring, vindicating God's character, these are things the church desperately needs today, and by church I mean the whole big deal of the church. As we continue in this part of the longer series on the Sabbath day, I think we will see more and more dimensions like this as we explore other texts. But isn't it natural that if Christians are to keep the Sabbath, first of all, they can keep it because Jesus kept it after the cross. He rested in the tomb on the Sabbath day. And baptism models on the death and resurrection of Jesus. Sabbath, from a Christian perspective, models on the death and resurrection of Jesus, that we keep the Sabbath on account of what God has done for us and on account of the fact that, that Jesus did in such a beautifully symbolic way. But we'll go deeper into some of those things as we move forward. Livius? From the text that we've read, I'm really drawn to Exodus 31, 33. It says the Sabbath was a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. So this I, the Lord, sanctify you, I think maybe helps us a little bit to know like, hey, what is the Sabbath about? What are we supposed to do? Maybe better than taking a nap. <laughs> In terms of salvation, the Sabbath would be the sign that God is the one who does it. We're resting in God's Yes, name. right. But I also went three chapters forward to Exodus 34, and thinking about God made the Sabbath holy, he sanctified it, and God's holiness is his character. And when he reveals to Moses his character in Exodus 34, I wonder if keeping the Sabbath, it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Maybe what we should be doing is imitate God and be merciful and gracious to others slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. When we engage in this idea, these activities, does that work to sanctify us, to make us holy, to become like him, to acquire his character? And is that one of the purposes of the Sabbath and what we're supposed to be engaging in on the Sabbath? What do you think about that? Yeah, well, the core meaning of holy is set apart, or to put it in other terms, different. And the Sabbath is a day for different. And for preachers, they may take a day off on Thursday. That was usually my day off as a preacher. And 
when we pastored in New York City, we'd go off to the cloisters or or a museum of natural history or something, You'd go to a fancy restaurant in the evening, things like that. That was our day off. That was in the rest sense, our Sabbath, you know, but the Sabbath was different because that's the day when I was doing things I didn't do most of the other days of the week, including preaching and teaching a Sabbath school lesson, et cetera. So to keep the Sabbath holy is to treat it differently because God blessed the day in a special way. Julie. I want to go back to Genesis 2. I saw this a number of years ago, and it was, to me, really kind of breathtaking. That first, that concept that God was in, this eternal God was in our time and space. I mean, of course, that comes up in different parts of the scripture, but it just first starts right there. He wants to be with us. But the second thing was the difference. And I have, I think Genesis chapter 2, the first few verses has to go along with the last chapter. There's a pattern. It's poetry, but it's real. God makes something, and he calls it good. And God makes something and he calls it good. And that's kind of a cycle and that ends that particular day and moves on. And he makes everything a little distinct there. Then he gets to make man and he calls him very good. And then he gets to the Sabbath and calls it holy. And I always used to think that that was part of the same continuum. And it's not. Holiness is not the same thing as being very, very, very good. Very good is part of holiness. But holiness is God and his presence in and through us in that time and in that space. And when I read the scriptures, anything that is holy or sanctified has something to do with God being a part of it. So we become holy, like you said earlier, he sanctifies us. We become holy by his presence in our lives, not just him being there, but the fact that we are now, he is now in us and we are in him. And it's kind of hard to explain, but that holiness thing doesn't pass on unless God is there. So Mm -hmm. to try to be holy on the Sabbath day doesn't make sense. It's part of him and us being together. And we accepting that togetherness and making him part of our lives. I don't know how else to say it. So I think that that whole beginning little phrase there in chapter two says so much that is kind of hidden in the background that I didn't see when I was younger. I think it's just beautiful. Sometimes the only way to say something is just spill it out. (laughs) And as you're talking, sometimes the details come together. Go ahead, Bob. I want to respond to a little chat that Liz had there. She says, obviously, rest is bigger than a nap. God doesn't need a nap. Just as lawyers rest their case, God is resting his case to the universe, including humans. There is a famous book written by an attorney named The Defense Never Rests is the name of the book. And so just so people understand that when you rest your case, you don't necessarily quit working on it in case anybody reads that. Just want to make that little point. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, Daniel has a comment here that I think is worth bringing into the audio discussion. He says, Sola Scriptura for Luther meant that the text stays, interpretations change. And so the evangelical book, From Sabbath to Lord's Day, most conservative Protestants believe in transference theory. Whatever was said in the Old Testament about the Sabbath applies to Sunday in the New Testament. So it is not as simple as it seemed to the SDA pioneers. This, of course, is not to say that the transference theory is valid, just that we are aware that the evangelicals in 1980s put their best minds to come up with an answer to that attack. Let's see. Daniel, would you care to elaborate on that? Because I see it's probably an addition to a whole series of comments there. Just for the record, could you elaborate a bit on the attack? The attack is that the Protestants pay homage to the Catholic Church by keeping Sunday because their founding principle is sola scriptura, yet they follow something which is not found in the Bible. But it's not as simple as it seems because of the transference theory. So most conservative evangelicals nowadays would argue, as you mentioned, that whatever was said about Sabbath in the Old Testament applies to Sunday in the New Testament. And there's a certain logic to that. We would say the things of Israel now apply to the church, etc. And so you can see how one would make that kind of an argument. But it's not an argument that came up with short of the attack. And that's the point, that in reaction to a critique, a person becomes creative and seeks to find in scriptures something new. And I think we all have a tendency to do that. But I come back to Mark 2.27, as we will again in a moment, and Jesus makes it clear that the Sabbath was not limited to Israel, not limited to Jewish people, was intended for all mankind. Could God change it? 
if God chose to do that, so he would. But I think we will see as we continue this study, a lot would be lost. That when you shift from Saturday to Sunday, you lose the connection of the Sabbath with the whole history of God's work for his people from the beginning. But that's for the future. And let's hear from Larry, and then we'll read Mark 2.27 once more. I would like you and or Bob to reply to the idea that Bob raised about an attorney resting, but that the defense never rests. And the connection to the fact that even though God completed creation and said rested, he didn't stop working. I think rest deserves additional study. And I'd encourage all of you to maybe take a concordance, as dangerous as that can be on its own, but just take the word rest and just go through, read through a bunch of Bible texts. What are the nuances here? Is there something deeper and bigger that we should be seeing there? I think that's an excellent suggestion. Once more, Mark 2, 27. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. All right. So we noted earlier that this text implies that the Sabbath was made for Adam rather than man for the Sabbath. But here, one more thing. The Sabbath was made for humankind, for Adam. And again, Hebrew has very few pronouns. Greek has 47 of them. So Greek can be more clear. When somebody's translating from the Hebrew to the Greek, the Greek can sometimes be more clear because of the richness of the prepositions. So here it's saying the Sabbath was made, in the Greek, it's dia with the accusative. Greek prepositions can have different meanings based on the case of the word that they're associated with. That won't be on the test, so don't worry about what I just said. I'm just letting you know there's stuff going on here, and I'm just going to explain it without truly explaining it. But it's the Sabbath is for the sake of humanity, for the benefit of humanity. And this is so clear. The Sabbath was intended for the benefit of humanity. It was not intended as a burden. You'll notice the other three texts, James 2, Galatians 3, etc., were about God's law in general, about God's purposes in general. But this is the one text that speaks specifically to the purpose of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for the benefit of human beings. It was made for the sake of human beings. When we truly understand the Sabbath, when we truly embrace it, it's one of the best things that ever happened to us. That's what I think this text is saying. And you have something similar to that. Isaiah chapter 58 is an Old Testament equivalent of Mark 2 on that particular point. Isaiah 58 and verses 13 and 14. If you keep your foot, from breaking the Sabbath, and from doing as you please on my holy day. If you call the Sabbath a delight, and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way, and not doing as you please, or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride on the heights of the land, and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob, the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The Sabbath is a delight. And this is one thing that I think I have appreciated from the Jews, because you go to a Friday night synagogue service, and it always ends with a potluck. But they don't call it a potluck. It's Oneg Shabbat. Ah, oh, Oneg Shabbat. I remember sitting next to a lady, and she just looked out at the table and says, I love Oneg Shabbat. It's the best, you know? And Oneg is this word delight. Call the Sabbath a delight. Oneg Shabbat is delight of the Sabbath. So for the Jews, the Sabbath is not a burden. It may be for some. Legalism impacts us all. But the Jews, in their language, call the Sabbath a delight and a day to feast, a day to enjoy, a day to celebrate. You bring in the Sabbath with Oneg Shabbat, this wonderful feast of special breads and fruits and all kinds of delightful things. So, 
I frankly grew up with a different perspective on the Sabbath. It was a requirement, something you do or else. You know, and anytime you do anything just slightly off base, you're looking over your shoulder or looking up for the lightning bolts. You know, that's how I was raised. And it's taken a long time and I'm still working on it. But to learn to truly delight in the Sabbath, you can't make somebody delight in something. You can't tell a kid, you will eat this vegetable and you will enjoy eating it. Well, they'll eat it maybe, but you can't make them enjoy it. That is a choice. So God respects our freedom and invites us to explore the Sabbath in its most delightful depths. Daniel. That's why this idea of fasting on Sabbath comes from 19th century Puritan asceticism. It doesn't come from the Jewish mindset or culture at all. The Jews put the two fasting days as far away from Sabbath as it was possible in the calendar. Because in their understanding, fasting and Sabbath, as oneg, as delight, do not go well together. Mm. Yet those of you who are older, you still might remember how in Adventism, Sabbath, or periodically some Sabbaths per year were proclaimed as the fasting days. Mm. Mm -hmm. So okay. people have been damaged for life because of that legalistic connection. So that Sabbath becomes even a burden when, especially the younger generation children who it was not properly explained and interpreted to them, then it's a burden that they were not able to bear. Yeah, yeah. And I appreciate you bring that up because in my class on the fundamental beliefs, I note that the primary influence on Adventists of the Sabbath is the Puritans, how Puritans kept Sunday. But I point out that at least equal to that should be the Jews who have kept Sabbath longer than the Puritans or anybody else. And for the Jews, the Sabbath is much different than it was for the Puritans. And Adventists could probably learn from that heritage, at least some, whereas the Puritan heritage was very severe heritage. Michael, and we're heading toward last words, so let it be you. I appreciate what you had to say, John, because I remember as a kid, get up, we're going to church. You got to get ready. And it was frankly drudgery. I didn't want to go, and I made that plain. And it's amazing how a few years and a little perspective that has changed a great deal. I look forward to going to church. Mm, yeah, I appreciate that testimony. I think a lot of people can say that. And Graham Maxwell does bring out in one place in Conversations About God, as I remember, he brings out the idea that for children, the freedom of the Sabbath may not be complete. <laughs> you know, in other words, parents may say, okay, we're going, you'll be dressed and you'll be going with us. But hopefully when they reach a certain age, they will embrace it for themselves rather. But yeah, that challenging place, you know, before kids really want to go, how you handle it as a parent is very challenging. Aaron. Could God have created and commanded Sabbath a different way? And the way that God creates and brings about sabbath is through resting and the context is spending time with his creation and so i think that is a beautiful thing and ties into a point that has been stated that the sabbath is rather than a divine commandment is a symbol of divine commitment mm, yeah I think an operative principle might be the word different again. Sabbath is set apart, different. And one thing I've done most of my life is I eat the same breakfast pretty much six days a week. But on the Sabbath, I have a very different one and one that I really look forward to. And just to make it special, to set it apart. And it doesn't have to be a drudgery to set it apart. It can be different in a delightful way as well. Well, I think it's time to draw this to a close for today. We will continue with number five in the handout as we move forward. And we'll continue on this topic of Sabbath, why the Sabbath, and what difference it can make for us, and how it expresses the character of God. I think that's the direction we want to head soon. Let's pray. Lord, it's been good to be together, and many people will listen to this on the Sabbath day. 
And if they don't, it is because it will help to prepare for the Sabbath day. And Lord, you have given this as a gift. Help us to truly understand what that means. Help us to learn how to make that happen. Help us to learn what delight in the Sabbath is all about. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.